Welcome to Never Again Is Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I am Evelyn Marcus. And I am Phyllis Zimbler Miller. In recent years, we have sent more and more, we have seen more and more athletes using their position to advocate for change. Today, we will learn about student athletes who want to lead in stopping anti-Semitism and other forms of discrimination. Stacy Gellin is the founding director of the Ferenc Institute for Ethics, Human Rights, and the Holocaust, and a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University. Her organization just launched the Athletes Against Antisemitism and Discrimination Consortium that offers a program to student athletes to become leaders against antisemitism and other intolerance and discrimination. Stacy, welcome to our podcast. Phyllis and I have been looking forward to discussing with you how student athletes can speak up against anti-Semitism. I'm glad to have having me. First question today, which is, can you tell us why you started the Athletes Against Anti-Semitism and Discrimination program? Sure. So in 2015, I founded a nonprofit organization called the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust. Our main mission at the time was to understand the ways in which the Holocaust was a unique example of medically sanctioned genocide and how it continued to influence current society. So basically what that means is that we examined the ways in which the medical and scientific communities were involved in every aspect of labeling, persecuting, and eventually killing millions of people based on this one idea of people being biologically unfit. So like how systems of power work together to create hierarchies of human life and created this us versus them environment in which some people were considered to be less than human and some people weren't even considered to be human at all. Originally, our audience that we targeted uh, were parts of the, mem the medical community because of the concept of kind of healers becoming killers um, and people who were dedicated to the idea of healing, taking advantage of people at their most weak and vulnerable. But then time went on um, and I realized that it's not so much the audience, it's more the topic that really has the power to make a difference and speak to people in this broad sense and connect with them. So we needed to expand our audience. And the idea of the Holocaust as this seminal example of a time when people were treated without any regard for human dignity and killed based on their perceived value to society, what they can offer society, how they can contribute. That was really something that seemed to resonate with all people. So rather than just being seen as a Jewish issue, um, this was something that people really seemed to you know, find an attachment to. It wasn't something that was just for the healthcare professions, it was a human issue. And so I started to understand that we needed to pivot in terms of the way that we were addressing the topic. And what really drove that home for me was when we took the Davidson College men's basketball team to Auschwitz in 2018. And seeing the impact that this trip had on those kids. Wait, why? Tell us about why you took them. I mean, how did that happen that you took this basketball team to? So, um, in 2017, I was working at Misericordia University, which is um, a Catholic school founded by the Sisters of Mercy um, in Pennsylvania, Dallas, Pennsylvania. I had started a center for human dignity and the Holocaust there. And we had, as we were launching this, we had Eva Moses Kaur come in and speak. Eva was a Holocaust survivor. She was a survivor of Mengele's twin experiments. She came in, she spoke to a sold out crowd, which was often the case with Eva. Um, and I watched as, you know, everyone in the audience just sat there wrapped, you know, with the tension and just, you know, the way she connected, I've never seen anyone, you know, Holocaust survivor, anybody doesn't any, any form of lecture connect with people the way she did. 
So when I met Eva, I told her that day, I promised to make sure that her story continued to be told. Um, and then she told me that I was a firecracker and she knew I would keep my promise. And I took that very seriously. So in September of 2017, I was, that was when I first met Eva. Um, and I found out that she ran these trips every summer for 100 people. She would take them back to Auschwitz and Birkenau, which is where the sites of the experiments that were performed on her took place so that she could make sure that everybody heard these stories from her. They walked the sites that she walked. And I said, well, we, we've got to make sure that we do something to get the word out there in a bigger way. So in, I uh, was so like, well, what can we do? I was working with a colleague and friend of mine. Her name is Amanda Caleb. She was a Davidson alum. And we, we knew that they were recording a documentary about her that summer. So we said, all right, camera crew is already there. We've already, you know, we, we've got everything in place. No, we need to do it this summer. So we were coming up, you know, what can we do? We wanted to, you know, work with young people. She said, we need to call Coach Bob McKillop. I said, okay, I know Coach Bob McKillop was Stephen Curry's coach. Why? Other than that, why, why are we calling Coach McKillop? She said, I'm telling you, he's special and the Davidson team is special. And I said, you went to Davidson. You are drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> How special can they really be? I will tell you now, I, I did not go to Davidson. Um, I, I have no affiliation with Davidson other than this trip. They they are a special place. Um, they, Coach McKillop is a special, special person. They were a special team. It is a special place. We called them. We spoke to them. I believe it was two days after they were eliminated from the March Madness tournament. And they said, absolutely. They held wait, a wait, special emergency me, meeting. Let me clarify that they would go on this trip with Eva, okay? I want to clarify that that's what you were offering them, that they would take their student athletes on this trip to Auschwitz, right? We called them in at the end of March and said, um, in July, we want to take you on this trip, four-day trip. You're not going to touch a basketball. <laughs> uh, and it's going to be emotionally draining. And we're not going to do anything fun, right? No, uh, and they said... You know, Coach McKillop said, I, I really want to do it. But Coach McKillop is um, he's a he loves his players. We said, let me let me talk to the guys. And every one of them said, yes, that, that's that's how we got there. And that is so we how had that is how your project, uh, your program for student athletes uh, against anti-Semitism and discrimination started. Correct. That's right. That's right. 2018. Yeah. That's when yes. it started. Uh, by the way, I saw the documentary about that trip. It's amazing. I could recommend it to everybody. I think I saw thank it you. on YouTube. Yes, thank you. Um, which other organizations are participating in this consortium that is putting together and offering this program to student athletes? Really new, you know, this is something that ever since then has kind of been on my mind, you know, this this is something that we need to do, something we need to do. Obviously, COVID kind of <laughs> threw a wrench in those plans, um, but it was something we knew we needed to do. Um, and we felt very strongly, I felt very strongly that we needed to work with Candles Holocaust Museum and Education Center, which is the, um, the center that Eva founded. So we've been working with them ever since then. So our two organizations are the main organizations involved. And then the additional founding members, uh, Coach McKillop has retired. He just recently retired and he is going to head up this consortium. Um, he really, he firmly believes in the mission. He is doing this because he believes in it. And that is so wonderful. So he is heading it up. His guidance and leadership have been integral, not only to the Davidson trip, but to every program that we've run since then. I can call him and say, I want to run this program. Will you help me? And he is there in a heartbeat. Um, obviously, we have Amanda, who I told you about, who was, uh, you know, right there with me when we first started this program. She's also a part of it, as is Alex Kaur, who is Eva's son. Um, and then we have Graham Honecker and Jerry Logan, who wrote this book right here. It's called Unbracketing. Um, Big time college basketball done the right way. It's a story, it tells the story of several teams, but it focuses on the Davidson trip 
to Auschwitz. And so they're part of the consortium. And then um, this is another wonderful book called By the Grace of the Game, The Holocaust, A Basketball Legacy and an Unprecedented American Dream. It's written by Dan Grunfeld. He's the grandchild of Holocaust survivors and the son of Olympic gold medalist, NBA player and executive Ernie Grunfeld. Uh, he's the author of this book. So these two books play a big role in our consortium. And finally, um, Rabbi Erez Sherman, who I believe you both know, the and rabbi of Sinai Temple yeah. in Los Angeles, um, and also the host of the podcast, Rabbi on the Sidelines. So those are the our founding members, but we are hoping to expand our consortium and add like-minded organizations and individuals. Great, great. Yes, uh, Rabbi Sherman was uh, on our show also. Yes. He told us about your program. We got excited when he told us about it. Yep. But can you share with our audience now the content of the program? I mean, what do you do with these student athletes besides the trip? Okay, obviously, the trip is, you know, look, I can talk until my face turns blue. It's never going to be as impactful mm -hmm. as someone who can actually be there. So our goal is starting in the summer of 2024 to take teams to Auschwitz. Um but, you know, I, look, I'd love to tell you we can take every team. Obviously, that's not feasible. So the question then becomes, and I think this is a large issue that we have in Holocaust education today, how can we think outside of the box and how can we reach that next generation? So um, I can tell you from personal experience, I have a 13-year-old son. Um, this is what I do for a living. He's not super interested in reading tons of books. Um, he's a little bit scared. You know, he knows what happened and it's it's a little bit frightening to him. Um, he read Dan Grunfeld's book and he came in and he read it for a, a school project. He was allowed to read any book he wanted. And he said, I love this book. I, this book to me, it combines sports, which he loves, um, and the story of Dan's grandmother. And um, he, it really, for him, it was an easy way for him to kind of, you know, kind of op open the door into this world for him. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to offer as many ways as possible to do that for student athletes. So how can we use the lessons of the Holocaust to create ethical leaders? That's, to me, really, I think, where we need to be at at this point. So we are offering a speakers bureau. That's the first thing. So we've done, um, I know Graham and Jerry in their unbracketed book and Coach McKillop have done book talks and book signings across the country. Um, so that's one aspect of what we're doing, you know, going in, talking about their stories, talking about the trip, how it impacted them. That's one aspect to be able to go in you know, speak to teams, speak to athletic departments, that one-on-one -on -one, um, attention, I think really gets through to people. I think also offering the opportunity to kind of catch a kid who's interested in doing something and be able to kind of spot them, see them, and then offer our services. Like we're the adults in the room. <laughs> so, you know, there are kids out there and I can tell you firsthand from working with the Davidson kids who want to use their platform um, and they want to know how they can do it. So how can we offer our services to help make that connection? We offer the education, but then we offer that connection as well. Go ahead, Phyllis. Let's roll back a minute. When you first start working with these young people, do you find that they do come in with prejudices that because they've been exposed to anti-Semitism and sometimes they may not realize that they've been exposed to anti-Semitism? So that's where when we do small group workshops with them, um, and oftentimes that's where Dan's book comes in, By the Grace of the Game. We start with that oftentimes, um, and we're developing a curriculum based on his book. As I said, um, the inspiration for that, as I, you know, my son will be embarrassed when I see this, but it did come from him because I saw the way that it impacted him. So being able to create um, this guided curriculum with questions that meet the student athletes where they are. That is the key. You know, it's a different world, honestly. It's, you know, there's TikTok, you know, 30 seconds of their attention. So you have to be able to meet them where they are. So giving them parts of the book to read that are particularly engaging or meaningful and asking them questions about not only, you know, what it, 
what do they kind of, what are they getting out of that part of the book? But also are there times in their lives where they've experienced forms of identity-based hate so they can connect the dots? Um, that's really important. That's something that, again, how do you make it resonate with this generation? And then how do you, it's about education, engagement, and empowerment. So those three things are really at the heart of what it is that we do. So you kind of being able to, I think that team environment is really important. So being able to work with them as a team, it also becomes a team building activity. Mm. So we try to offer it at all different levels. If you can do it as a team, that helps again with the team building. If you can do it where you're bringing in a speakers bureau, you can kind of see some people will take to it. Other people won't. Um, you offer kind of the safe atmosphere when there's a team there as well. Mm -hmm. And then you'll offer the opportunity for students to contact you and, you know, well, what are those leadership opportunities and how can we take advantage of that? Um, Stacy, what have been some of the reactions of student athletes uh, when confronted with the history of the Holocaust? I have to tell you, so, you know, we put this trip together uh, in 2018. We knew it would be a life-changing experience for them. Look, I just got back from a trip that I ran for adults to um, to Poland and also to Greece because um, I have some, some connections. I would do some interfaith work with the Greek Orthodox Church. It's a life-changing experience for anybody. Um, you don't know how people are going to respond ever when you take anybody on a trip like this. I didn't know how much of a life-changing experience it was going to be for me. Watching these kids, none of whom are Jewish, none of whom have any type of direct connection to the Holocaust, have this experience. And then we did the interviews that you saw in the documentary you don't know what they're taking away from it. We had, we made a deal with the videographers and the photographers who were there. We said, you cannot take any footage of anybody when you can clearly see that they're experiencing something because the documentary footage, that's secondary. The experience is primary. One of us was stationed at the front with the majority of the kids and then we learned very quickly one of us had to hang back because there was always someone. There was always someone who needed more time, who needed a minute to collect themselves. Um, the interviews at the end, I conducted all the interviews at the end and I was stunned by the detail that they remembered, by the emotion, by what they took away from this. And a lot of them repeated the same things. So I asked them afterwards, because we did our debriefing sessions with them. But I said to them, did you, did you talk to each other? They chose to hold their own team meeting apart from any of us because they felt that they needed to talk about it. I knew at that moment that something special had occurred. But then they came back and I didn't know how it would impact them when they came back. A few months after they returned, the Tree of Life massacre took place. And they called me and they said, we wanna do something, can you help? And I said, of, of course, that's what I'm here for. And they chose to write a statement of solidarity and read it out loud before a home game. Obviously, I mean, I don't even have words. Even now when I say it, I mean, I have chills. That, you know, was everything. There was, they reached out to the local Jewish community to offer their support. They were, they became ambassadors. And that's the whole reason we did it was to create multipliers, to create leaders. We had one of the players, he became, he was very interested in, in music and uh, he went on, he became our first, we created a position for him as an emerging scholar. He created the music for our documentary uh, based on his experience. 
One of the players, he was a senior. He published several written pieces and wrote his senior thesis on Jacob Renner and Eastern European collaboration with the Nazis during World War II. Wow. Um, the Davidson student population, this is not the basketball team. This is the entire student population. Use the trip as a platform to launch a petition to start a Jewish studies program at Davidson. The first person to sign it was Coach McKillop. The president of the school reached out to me to see, you know, how can I help? Um, and, then, and then there was Kellen Grady. Um, Kellen Grady, who I apologize every time I say this because I know he doesn't like it when I tell the story, but I think it's important. There is a tzedakah box, although they've since automated it. And now it's like you have to use a credit card, but it used to just be the regular tzedakah box that you put money in. He, we walked in, he walked in last, you know, I told you there was always one of us kind of behind, so I just wanted to make sure everything was okay. Uh, he put 50 American dollars into that Sadaka box when he walked in. And he went on, he graduated from Davidson. He got his fifth year of eligibility because of the COVID year. He went on to play basketball at the University of Kentucky, which is a big time basketball program. He used his experience as the impetus for creating College Athletes for Respect and Equality, which was um, a social justice initiative that he launched in conjunction with, um, you know, my nonprofit organization to raise awareness about systemic racial injustice and promote equality through education. On Yom HaShoah, one year after our trip, he stated for some a program that we were running Auschwitz taught me the importance of respecting the dignity of all individuals regardless of their background on Yom HaShoah and every day it's imperative that we continue to honor and remember the victims of the Holocaust while also making a concerted effort to continue to respect the dignity of all people that year the Davidson that you know the next year 2020 in the COVID year um, they participated in a reading of the names of the victims of the Holocaust virtually, which is available on um, the Friends Institute's website. That's a lot of stuff. It's a lot. That's a lot. It's amazing. And that, so I just want to review this for our audience because there's so much information. So you took this trip in 2018. You have continued to do all kinds of amazing things with student athletes. But 2024 will be the first time that you're taking another trip to Auschwitz. Is that correct? And largely, as I said, I mean, we had planned to kind of do this sooner, but, yeah, there was you know, COVID. international travel with um, college students became a little bit difficult. So we continue to work with these students, you know, online. We continue to work with them individually, offer pathways for them as much as we could um, to mentor them kind of send them out into the world to do their own thing. Um, but then we decided it was time to formalize this program as a consortium. Um, it also helped that Coach McKillop retired. It gave him a little bit more time to help us to dedicate to this program um, because, you know, even though he would give us all the time in the world, there are only 24 hours in a day. So um, that is how, that's why we, you know, just launched this official consortium um, just recently. Got it. Okay. So thank you for explaining the timeline. Evelyn? Sure. How do you think, Stacy, student athletes in general can make a difference in combating anti-Semitism? And unfortunately, as we all know, anti-Semitism is on the rise um, everywhere. But college campuses are one of the places where we've seen it the most. Um, and I think that athletes have a very um, high profile role on campuses. And what I think most people don't realize is that only 2% of college athletes ever go on to play professionally mm -hmm. in their sport. Um, while they are on campuses though, again, they have a very high profile role and they need to do things with that. They, they, they become leaders on the team um, because they have that kind of leadership capability within them. So, you know, again, it's kind of up to us as the adults in the room to give them those opportunities. 
sense. And I think what I've seen is they want those opportunities. You know, we worked during during COVID through this College Athletes for Respect and Equality program. We worked with a lot of college athletes. They wanted to do more. They they know they have an opportunity. They know they have a platform and they want to use it, but they don't know. And I think that's the unique position of kind of that age group is they want to do it but they don't know how to channel that desire and that motivation. So if we can come in and we can help them do it, it benefits them in terms of their personal growth and development. It benefits the team because it brings the team together. There's a quote in the Unbracketed book where Keyshawn Pritchett, who was one of the athletes who came with us said, look, I've been playing on this team for years. This team is closer than any other team because of what we went through together. So it benefits the team. It benefits the college. Look at you know what I just said, the, the people who were not on this team started a petition as a result of the publicity you know, that that the whole college received from this trip it benefits the community. You you create relationships between, you know, the community and the players and the college. There's so much there when you're working with these student athletes and something like this stays with them. They go on to become multipliers. It stays with them and wherever they go. And it, it becomes embedded within the college program itself. So I think that, you know, it's such a great age to work with and it's such a great just in general time to be able to kind of, you know, work with these kids. So, you know, that's the reason why we're focusing on this. We're happy to work with athletes of any age because, you know, as we've seen again over the past few years, athletes are influencers. And, you know, what they say, when they talk, people listen, whether or not we like it, that's the reality. So we are more than happy to work with any athletes. But um, at this point, you know, we we have focused our program on student athletes. And so uh, individual student athletes or teams who want to join your program, how can they do that? athletes and coaches who have an interest can contact me directly um, via email, which is stacygallon at forensinstitute.org. Um, we're in the process of building a communication list, an email list, where we will update our progress and provide further information as to how teams and coaches can learn more about the consortium and hopefully upcoming trips to Auschwitz. We're also going to have a virtual information session this fall for anyone who's interested. So we can just kind of, you know, tell them more about this program and what we're doing. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at A-A-A-D, your voice, like add your voice. Um, and also on Facebook, um, we're under just the regular Athletes Against Anti-Semitism and Discrimination. For anyone who's listening, we need brand advocates. We need people who can help us spread the word on this new initiative to interested parties, uh, to coaches, to student athletes who have an interest in our mission. Obviously, we always need financial support and donors. Anyone can learn more about what we do at um, forensinstitute.org. Um, you can find it right on the homepage, a link. Um, and you can contact me again if you're interested in whether it's learning more, or donating, whatever it is. Obviously, fighting anti-Semitism is a big task. We need all the help that we can get. Um, and we always need as many supporters and like-minded individuals to work with as possible. So that being said, you know, this opportunity to be on this podcast is greatly appreciated. Um, it helps us get the, the message out. Um, and, you know, I, I really, really thank you both for giving me this opportunity to just share some information about what it is that we're doing. Well, yes. we, we thank you. And before we give you your chance for last word, would you please tell the audience who Ben Ferenz was and why it, it's so important that you've named your or renamed your institute for him? And I think you should spell his last name. So when people are looking online for your URL, that would be a good idea if you spell his name too. Absolutely. So Ben Ferenz was the last living prosecutor from the Nuremberg trials. Um, he passed away in April at the age of 103. He dedicated his life 
First, obviously, during the Nuremberg trials, he dedicated his life to um, prosecuting Nazis and holding them accountable for their crimes. But then afterwards, he really believed again in continuing to use the lessons of the Holocaust to ensure that anyone anywhere who was violating human rights should be held accountable. Um, that's very much in keeping with the mission of our organization. Our motto is remember the past, protect the future, act now. Um, and as I said before, while the idea of the Holocaust as the only example of medically sanctioned genocide does remain a very strong component of what we do, um, we really kind of try and, and strive to create these ethical leaders of tomorrow so we can make sure that we're not only remembering the past, but, and this was something that Eva Kaur felt very strongly about, it's not enough just to remember. Right. We have to do more than that. We have to also make sure that never again is more than just a rallying cry. So we have to use those lessons to create a better future um, and pursue justice and promote tolerance and equality. So we were honored that um, Ben Ferenz's family felt um, felt that it was suitable for us to use his name and, and, and you know, uh, bestowed that honor upon us. So um, the Ferenz Institute is F. E R E N C Z. That's how you spell uh, his last name. So it's the Ferenz Institute dot org. Um, and just in case anyone's interested, my name is S T A C Y G A L L I N at Ferenz Institute dot org. So please feel free. I always make this this promise anytime I speak to young people in particular, if you contact me, I promise you that I will help in the same way that I made that promise to Eva. Um, I promise that I will always do my best to help. I think that, you know, that that's part of the deal, right? That that's part of, you know, when we say again, never again, we have to make good on that promise. Stacey, this was such an inspiring talk. We thank you so much. And we thank our listeners. For those of you who want to know more about Evelyn, myself, and our podcast, you can go to our Never Again Is Not Now podcast channel on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And as we end every episode, we say, please, without putting yourself in physical harm, speak up against anti-Semitism and all hate.